Uh, apologies have been received from Deputy Nee Smith, from Senator Grace O'Sullivan and Senator Polly Coffey. At the outset, I remind members, staff, witnesses and those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones interfere with the sound system and make it difficult for the parliamentary reporters to report the meeting and also television, radio, web streaming, etc. Um, so I just ask you to take a moment to check your mobile phones. I, I'd also draw your attention to the microphones in front of you and just to be just 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 keep um, literature or, or anything away from them because it also interferes with it. I now wish to read some formal notices for the information of the witnesses. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of a long-standing practice um, to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise nor make charges against a person outside the House or the official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. The Committee decided to hold a hearing on the question of indemnity and participants in various state and EU-funded schemes. The Committee is aware that this is a complex issue for many state and local bodies and for people involved in running and taking part in various schemes. With any activity, there is an inherent risk. We can mitigate risks with proper training, health and safety measures, including signage, high-vis jackets and protective clothing, etc. We can transfer the risk by taking out insurance cover, or we can accept the risk. The committee thinks that there is a need for a national volunteerism strategy, but, it is, but in the meantime, it is important that we avoid the chilling effects that exposure to risk and liability could have on encouraging volunteerism. The same applies to um, various schemes supported by the state. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome the following witnesses to the committee meeting here today. Uh, Pat Kerwin, Kerwin, Deputy Director and Head of Enterprise Risk, um, Brian Larkin, Senior Enterprise Risk Manager, and they're from the State Claims Agency. Uh, representatives from the IPB Insurance, Mr Michael Garvey, Chief Executive Officer, Mr Matt Raffertry, Director of Underwriting, Mr Michael Wheelahan, Head of Claims. Representatives from the County and City Management Association, uh, Mr Tom McHugh, Deputy Chief Executive and uh, Director of Municipal Services in Dunleary, Town County Council. Um, it is proposed that any opening statements or submissions or other documents supplied by witnesses or other bodies to the committee relating to the topic of this meeting be published on the committee's website. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. I now call on Mr Pat Kerwin, Deputy Director and Head of Enterprise Risk at the State Claims Agency, to make his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, members of the committee, um, I would like at the outset to thank the Chairman of the committee for this opportunity to address you today in relation to the State Claims Agency's consideration of indemnity and participants, including volunteers, in various state and EU-funded EU schemes. I am joined by my colleague Brian Larkin, Senior Enterprise Risk Manager uh, with the State Claims Agency. My open statement has been provided to the committee. Uh, this statement contains information on the establishment the structure and the evolution of the State Claims Agency, including the two state indemnity schemes operated by the SCA, namely the Clinical Indemnity Scheme and the General Indemnity Scheme. The SCA's activity under the General Indemnity Scheme is of most relevance when discussing indemnity and insurance-related matters for rural and community development programmes and schemes under the aegis of this committee. The GIS is provided to delegate uh, uh, the GIS, uh, the General Indemnity Scheme, is provided to delegated state authorities who are formally delegated under the National Treasury Management Agency Amendment Act 2000. Delegated state authorities are bodies that are typically organisations that are wholly or substantially funded by the state and, a, their, employ they, uh, and, and their a, employees are civil or public servants and b, 
Their activities relate to the provision of services uh, on behalf of the state. Currently, state indemnity does not apply to local authorities or to any of the above rural and community development programmes and schemes. While funding and some policy arrangements may derive from central government, unless a programme or scheme is being directly managed by a delegated body, state indemnity does not apply. This, for example, is the case with tidy towns. The decision to statutorily delegate a body or activity under state indemnity in respect of that body's personal injury-related liability uh, is a decision for the relevant government department in conjunction with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and the Department of Finance. I am happy to take any questions from the committee uh, uh, on the above. Thanks very much. Um, we now take an opening statement from um, Mr. Michael Garvey, Chief Executive Officer of the IPB Insurance. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the Chair, Deputy Carey, and the members of the committee for inviting IPB Insurance to participate in discussions on the topic of indemnity and participants, including volunteers, in various state and EU funded schemes. I am accompanied by our Director of Underwriting, Mr. Matt Rafferty, and our Head of Claims, Mr. Michael Whelan, and we look forward to engaging with the committee and hope we can be of assistance in this morning's discussions. By way of introduction to those of you who may not be familiar with IPB Insurance, I would like to take this opportunity to give you a brief history and background to the company. The name IPB is an acronym for Irish Public Bodies, stemming from our position as the mutual insurer of public bodies and local authorities in Ireland. Today, IPB is the only wholly Irish-owned mutual insurer in the market. The story of IPB's origins and early development is inextricably bound up in the challenges that faced the first government of the Irish Free State in the 1920s. The rationale for the creation of Irish public bodies was the realisation by the state that profits generated from the premiums paid by a large number of Irish public bodies were resulting in net capital outflows from the state. IPB was therefore established in 1926 to protect the insurable interests of its members who have evolved over time and now consist of the state's local authorities, education and training boards, regional assemblies and the HSE. We also protect a range of state, semi-state and public service related organisations. As a mutual, our ethos and business model means that we are not motivated by growth or profit. Our motivation is to protect the insurable interests of our members and related stakeholders in a responsible and sustainable manner for their mutual benefit. We are a specialist insurer within the liability insurance market. Our risk appetite is reflective of our members' risk profile and similar risks closely aligned to our member activities. We operate in niche markets within our stated risk appetite, including state and semi-state organisations and agencies such as health, education, sport, community-focused services and other areas of service to the public. IPB provides a wide, a wide range of products designed to protect members, such as public liability, employers' liability, property and motor fleet. We also provide additional covers to address new and emerging risks such as cyber and data security and environmental impairment protection. A key feature of our approach is that we continuously evolve our product and risk management solutions to reflect the changing risk profile of our members and to ensure that we have the capacity to transfer all their insurance risk and exposure from their balance sheet to ours. We also provide a wide range of additional services to members, free of charge, including risk management solutions through our dedicated risk management team. We provide ongoing training to members and non-members through nationwide risk conferences, risk remediation supports and insurance clinics. We also provide a contractor insurance advisory service, as well as other features and benefits, including risk guides and risk training videos. Over the past six years, we have delivered risk management seminars and conferences to an excess of 10,000 delegates from member and client operations. In relation to the topic for discussion this morning, IPB provides insurance, a range of insurance covers to state EU funded schemes, including community employment schemes, the rural social scheme, RSS, and TUS, the community work placement scheme. With specific regard to employment schemes such as the RSS and TUS, <coughs> IPB has been insuring these schemes since 2014. 
we acquired this business through a competitive process within the insurance market by an appointed insurance broker. IPB provide public liability, employers' liability, personal accident, property and motor special types insurance to these schemes. Since 2017, IPB have been insuring a number of community employment schemes, which again was secured following a competitive process through an insurance broker. We provide employers' liability, public liability, fidelity guarantee insurance, professional indemnity and employers' practices liability insurance to these schemes. We ensure approximately 17,000 individuals participating across all three schemes, which are broadly involved in the same type of community-based work activities, which include clerical, shop assistant, care, creche assistant type work, services to the community and the elderly, including house, attic insulation, light repairs, DIY, daycare and meals on wheels. Community projects including tidy towns, care and maintenance of community centres, sports clubs, upkeep of common community areas, canal river walks, hedge cutting, wall building, etc., and light construction projects around heritage and community-owned properties. Our mutual ethos is centred around our members, and we understand the important role we play in protecting our members to provide them with peace of mind and freedom to focus on delivering their local, to their local communities. We are also actively involved in supporting social and community initiatives through government and member partnerships. We are currently co-funding a 1.6 million programme with the Department of Rural and Community Development to, to support social enterprises nationwide, working with our local authority members. To conclude, Chairman, I wish to thank you again for the opportunity to attend and we look forward to assisting you this in this morning's discussions and addressing any questions you may have. Thanks very much, Mr Garvey. I now call on Mr Tom McHugh, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Municipal Services in Dunleary, Red Town. County Council. I, I don't have any opening statement to, to make. Uh, I'm here in support of the, uh, the uh, attendance of, of IPB, uh, representing the CCMA, City and County Managers Association. If there's any questions in particular uh, in relation to local authority activities, I'll, I'll do my best to address those. Thanks Mark, very much, Thank Mr. McHugh. I now ask um, Deputy Michael Collins um, to, to, to bring forward his questions, please. Yeah, it's just, um, I suppose, uh, thank you, Anya, for being before us here today. Um, I'd like to, I suppose, express any just concerns in, in relation to insurance difficulties with uh, many of the community voluntary groups that are um, in existence. I'm involved in quite a lot of community voluntary groups myself, and I suppose uh, insurance is a huge, huge issue um, uh, for them, for their survival, basically. Uh, one of the groups I'm involved in, I think we're paying over €3,000 in insurance, and we're a community voluntary from the... From, from start to finish, the 16 members elected as a community council. Nobody gets paid, nobody gets an expense out of it, and we still have to go out every weekend, every Saturday night, um, basically selling lotto tickets so that we can pay our insurance and pay our accountants and, and the difficulties that we, ha we have through that. We have you know, 15, 16 workers through schemes, rural social scheme, community employment scheme, two, so you know, the, you know it well, jobs pat and even HSE uh, schemes as well. Um, and um, some of our members are working in on tidy towns um, initiatives as well. And between insurance and, and guard vetting, it's becoming more and more and more difficult. And what's happening is, you'll see it and you'll listen to pe about people. And I think that needs to be taken uh, on board here today is that people are leaving community voluntary organisations because they're exhausted on the red tape side of it, not exhausted from the work because they know that's fulfilling and they appreciate that. I do know we do need insurance. Um, that's has, that's a, a no-brainer, uh, but I would um, ask you to look at um, the stringent rules and regulations and, uh, and the, sometimes the payments that are made out to people that are uh, claiming, um, uh, that the people that are claiming, um, and some, sometimes um, very little investigations are done into the claims. Um, I'm involved in a group ourselves where a situation like that happened and it was very unfortunate but we felt that if there was further investigation the insurance we feel find it too easy to just pay out rather than have the hassle of, of, of investigating the matter further and I think that you know if you know you, I, I think the gentleman there from uh, IPB's insurance said I know how many thousand groups you have they're, they're, a lot of them are under great, great difficulty to, to survive 
and if if we're making life more difficult for them, you'll have a lot less groups insured going forward because they won't be there. And I'd appreciate you might look into it like, like the people in the Tidy Towns remember one thing about the Tidy Towns groups, each and every one of them are volunteers as well. And they're out there every evening cleaning it and, and, and I see how careful they carry out their works, they have their yellow jackets, you know, they're they're really pulling out all the stops, but they sometimes there's more fences put in front of them. Um, and, and they're very survival is at risk here. Uh, for many of those groups that they want, uh, they, they, I mean, where do they find the money for insurance? Where do they find the money for everything? So, um, you know, this is a, unfortunately, I have a question that I must raise in the doll. It's a matter that I would like to go further into, uh, but at this stage, that's my feelings anyway. That's, that's on the ground. Oh, thank you. I had a specific question, Deputy, no, for... I know, just, okay. um, just generalising. So, so I'll ask um, Deputy Fitzmaurice. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming in. Um, Mr. Garvey, I know you're down my own neck of the woods originally um, in the insurance side of it. Look, guys, the reason that you're brought in here today is that there's a problem accruing. Uh, we've seen it in Galway and it seems to be spreading to other areas. Um, there are voluntary groups and you're all well aware of the amount of work that the Tidy Towns Committee does in every town, Ballantub or Glenamedi or all the different areas, be it in Clare or wherever, right around the country. And um, over the last few months, county councils have sent uh, out a letter. There's, it, there's a new system in some councils of construction and non-construction. Uh, cutting grass would be non-construction. If you're building a wall, obviously it's construction. But the councils are looking for an indemnity for those people that's out doing the, the work. Now, you've got to bear in mind that in these little villages, and some of them are small one-horse towns, to be quite honest about it, that there's two or three people that go out and maybe keep their town looking better and has made Ireland look an awful lot cleaner over the last number of years. Um, they, in some occasions, and we'd say County Galway, GRD, you'd be familiar with it, uh, would be doing work in the line of the bigger jobs especially, uh, if it was building a stone wall or um, maybe doing a bind, um, that would be uh, a help to an area and make it better. We are facing a situation at the moment that, and under TUS, the likes of GRD does it in Galway, and there's a body over all that, so I'm not just picking on them on their own. We are facing a situation at the moment that, be it in towns like Glenamady or Dunmore or smaller towns, Ballantubber, that um, you have to give an indemnity to the council the Tidy Towns group has. Now, they have insurance to do that, in fairness. But you also now, the, and you, you spoke about, um, Mr. Garvey, you spoke about the RSS and the, and the TUS. They are looking for an indemnity as well for the same thing that, uh, from the, the Tidy Towns Committee. So what the Tidy Towns Committee has to do is send their insurance into Galway County Council, or whatever county council for that matter. They have to do up a list of construction and non-construction and then the likes of the GRDs of this world are going to look at that and say, well, we can do this and we can do that and we can do the other, but we have to get a method statement. And the big problem is, and this is where the big problem is, and this just doesn't um, include the likes of the places where you have GRD, that if there's a voluntary uh, tidy towns group or two people in a one-horse village, that go out with their lawnmower, they are expected to go and have sign and enlighten three day and the one day, and put out their signs 600 metres, 400 metres, 200 metres, which they don't have the gear. And for, uh, I think it's Mr. McHugh, is that you're, you're with the county managers, is it? Does the county councils or the city councils, it might be different in city where you have a lot of workers doing the work for you, in fairness, I know that there's parks and all that. But some of you may be familiar with the situation in the small towns. And we are cutting ourselves if we are going to put this onus on ordinary people. Because what they will do, the voluntary sector in Ireland is unique and it's extraordinary. And what we are doing with this paperwork and indemnities and frightening the living daylights out of people is that it's going to be left there. And there is no council has the funding to do this work. 
but no one seems to want to address it. Everyone wants an indemnity, but at the end of the day, this work is being done for the benefit of rural Ireland. And there's another situation then that is very unclear. A town that has over a thousand cars passing through it, Milltown and County Galway, for example, you need a different category for that because obviously there's more cars going through it. If you're under a thousand, it's a small bit easier. If you go with your lawnmower now and you're a good citizen in a local village, and you, I saw it in Ballinamore Bridge, I was talking to Park O'Brien the other day, they don't know what to do because it's, it's like two grass verges. There's only one shop and one post office, or there's, there's actually no shop, there was, there was a post office, but it has the reminiscence of a village and to try and keep it tidy. And they don't know, they have to go now from what they're hearing. And people won't do this. They're not, they these are voluntary people that's working at other jobs. They are now being expected to do a three-day course. They are being expected to buy signs and have no money for buying the signs. Put them up, take them down every evening. And then the groups, the likes the GRD, are saying, we will assess a job where they're involved through TUS and through RSS. We will explain how we can do it. But by the way, we don't have enough supervisors to, for the, you have to have the three-day course done to set up all the signs. By the way, we don't have enough supervisors, so we won't be able to get to every job. Which is the greatest load of cobs wallop. If we're thinking about, in fairness to Ireland and through the tidy town sector, in every county, and in fairness to Michael Ring with the, with the funding he has given the tidy towns, this above all things isn't political. What has been done, it is lovely to drive through the towns of this country to see, even from the bust, to see how towns have got better looking. And we are now putting ourselves in a situation through, through bureaucracy, that's what I would call it, that these people are walking away. You know what's done, Mr. Garvey, below and on top They are constantly doing stuff. And now there was a meeting in, in Clare Galway about the types of insurances and the indemnities and all this. And we have seen people walking away from doing this work because they don't have the three-day sign in Knighton, they don't have the, the one-day courses done, they don't have time to do this, and it costs them money. And tidy towns groups, like fine if it's a big town, they have a few quid. But where you have two people involved in a town getting thousand euro a year, they're paying to cut the bit of grass, they get a lawnmower and they cut the bit of grass and they go out at night. We had the spring clean up there a few weeks ago where councils actually supplied them with gloves and different stuff. But at the same time, they're supposed to be taking... The, the, the tidy towns are basically asked now to take all the risk. And we're going down a road that people will walk away. And if that happens, the funding isn't there. I don't care what government is in power. They don't have the funding, in fairness to any government, to put the manpower to go into a town and do all the grass and do everything. It might happen in a city, but the spirit of volunteerism is under threat at the moment. And I want G, as a group, to come up with a way of resolving this issue. Because I think it's, it's, if, if the IPB or someone has to work and liaise with them, we are at a serious risk, in rural areas especially, of losing the goodwill, the thousands and millions of hours that's done by those great people for the pride of their parish. And now, through insurance bureaucracy, through having to sign your name, imagine you going out every day, picking up litter, going out with the power hose and cleaning the streets, going out and, and cutting the grass, and you're being asked to sign your life away that you will indemnify everyone. It's not on. And if we lose them people, as I say, there's a fair difference between city and rural areas. There's a fair difference between a big town. And the other thing that needs to be addressed is this, I don't fully understand this over a thousand, but they seem to be in a pure quagmire altogether if there's over a thousand cars going through your village. And if there's if you're within so many metres of the road, if you're cutting grass on the edge of the road, even though you're not interfering with traffic, you still have to put up the sign and lighting. 
So I want to know how we are going to solve this, because at the moment there's a lot of people out there. I see in, in an awful lot of loyalty, Glenamady and Craigs and Williams, there are a lot of areas like that, that, that and Milltown and places like that. And they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing. And then we have the bodies, the likes of the ones over the RSS and the twos saying, well, we'll look at it then, but we need that group to indemnify us. So I'm just wondering, Mr Garvey, as well, why have they insurance at all, the likes of the GRDs of this world, when they're being indemnified from the local group and they're being indemnified from Galway County Council? Sure, Lord Jesus, nothing could go wrong with, with, with all the indemnification they have. Now, someone needs to step up to the mark on this and take the pressure off the ordinary people out there that go out in the evening after they're coming from work. They're not getting paid. They get absolutely nothing for it. But there's been a responsibility being put on them now that they're afraid of their life because of this insurance. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy uh, Fitzmaurice. Do you want to come in, uh, yeah, Deputy O'Quinn? Um, sorry, I missed the first part of the meeting. This place is a little bit crazy uh, at the moment. And we're like a school that's got the exams next week and are focusing on the study, and you know where the study is, it's at the doors of Ireland, it's not in the, unfortunately, in the committee rooms here this week. Um, and that's the way it is, and we're being pulled hither and thither. This issue is hugely important. And the problem I have is that state bodies often function as if they're independent republics rather than all being the servants of the people. And unfortunately, I have seen this over many years, but as worse is getting, everyone is trying to throw it over on the next person. Instead of saying, the state, there's only one government in the country, there's only one Arachtas, all state bodies and all state funding are answerable ultimately to us. And in the end of the day, we're all answerable to the people, and therefore, the state should have a coherent view and sit down at tables and sort this out, no matter how long it takes between you. Now, when the RSS scheme, I'm not as familiar with CE as I am with RSS and TOOTH, for very obvious reasons. When the RSS was introduced, and it was a very particular scheme because we were implying farmers. And farmers are not unemployed. They were great workers. They had a lot of experience about doing things. Most of them were experienced in doing farm work. They were very, very handy. Their productivity was incredibly high in terms of scheme work. Now, the issue of indemnity came up. And my memory is, and I've double-checked it with the Department of Rural Affairs, that there's a very high indemnity required by the employer, i.e. the partnerships, in terms of insurance, in other words, I think it's public liability is 8 million or something, it's quite high. And there's also a high employer's liability. And that is a condition of the scheme from the centre. That's my understanding and my memory. And therefore, the employer is well insured and funded by the state, may I say. In other words, we said you have to get these insurances, but we'll give you the money to buy the insurances because otherwise the scheme doesn't work. Now, I hope nothing has changed in that part of it. Now, in this case then, we face a situation where local authorities have been stripped of permanent staff. And this was a constant battle between me and officials over the years when it came to CE schemes as to why they didn't allow them to stay on more than three years. And I used to argue, well, if it was out in the public parks here in Dublin, Phoenix Park, Harbour Park, any other park, whether there were OPW parks, as Stephen Screen, the Phoenix Park are, or the local authority parts, they had full-time paid staff who were going to be there to 65, now 66. And I used to say, well, look, when we look at schemes, and that was the reason the RSS, until the present government unfortunately changed it to six years, was absolutely permanent. But the farmers were not unemployed. So job activation doesn't come into the game. And there's an importance in this. So the theory behind it was you've got a cohort of workers because there are no outdoor workers available, certainly in County Galway, and I think in many other counties. They can't even keep the tar on the roads, not to mind go cutting bushes and 
tidying up the grass and doing the tidy towns. And it is my opinion, for what it's worth, that if you were to take out RSS tooth and see all that pile of workers out of, of rural Ireland today, that within, and just do it over the summer months, and let the grass grow, and when every football pitch was three foot in grass, and every tidy town, every town village in Ireland was looking like a rag bag, and Bart Falter, Falter would be going absolutely crazy, the public been going crazy. Every public space outside, you know, and there are plenty of public spaces, certainly a lot of public spaces where I am, owned by the communities. All, every community space was just left go wild, and litter not picked up, and so on. I think people will be shocked about how much we rely on these schemes to keep Ireland the way it is. So, now the other advantage, of course, if you could keep the, on the schemes longer, you train your people, and they have the safe passes, and they have the thing, they renew them, but they don't have to keep doing it. But if you have a two scheme, whatever, every year you have to start as, as if you never had anybody at all. It, can you imagine employing people on that basis? So, what I believe we need to do is that all the agencies get together and come on one mind as to what they need. And number two, the state has to pay for it, because there's nobody else to pay for this. Now, you're still getting, as a state, we are getting, the people are getting, the Arachtas are getting, the public service is getting, people who are more than willing to work at a very, very low cost. That's reality. 20 euro plus the welfare payment. I think we also need a national layout as to what everybody is required to do to go out on the road. And if it's safe pass and whatever. But as I said, there's no point. One of the problems in this is if you start short-term workers for a year and you have to keep training them every year, a new gang, it's a, a crazy situation. So the length of time you can stay in the scheme has a big bearing on the efficiency of this whole operation. Where would the We'd say the RSS, you have some permanent employees and you have some on this six-year thing, but at least you have them for six years. So if you train them up, get the safe pass or whatever, you only do the same renewal as a local authority worker would do on upgrading skills or whatever. Now, we need this sorted out in terms of insurance, in terms of requirements, and a clear message that if they follow the prescriptions in terms of signage and whatever, that they can work adjacent to the roads. Lots of people do it, private contractors do it, local authority workers do it, I can't see why these people can't do it as long as they adhere to the same standards. And in the end of the day, it all has to be paid for by the state. There is no second thing about that because they have no source of income other than the state. But then look at the public service being provided and compare that to the same service being provided by full-time employees in every city in Ireland and you're getting bloody great money, value for money. So, as I say, I missed the first part of the meeting. I'm wondering what process is now in place for all the different interests here to get round the table. And I suggest you might have File to Ireland into it too. Because I think File to Ireland have a big interest in making sure that we don't pull all these people off and then everyone will be shouting and roaring as to what the hell has gone wrong with Ireland, that every village is a utter disgrace and there would be a utter disgrace if we took these workers out. Thanks very much, Deputy O'Queen. By the way, can I make another point? In the old days, if I decided on a Tuesday to get the local community council out to pick up the rubbish in the, da, 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 the side of the road, I could do it. Now every community group is afraid to do the kind of work that was done voluntary, so don't give it a voluntary or solution and this one, it doesn't work anymore because of the rules, same rules and the same vulnerabilities apply, but there's no insurance there. And there's nobody there who's going to pay the insurance for all, every small community group, informal group, whatever. So if my local community council GA club decide to go out and pick up all the litter on the roads, they're not in a position to do so because they haven't done the safe passes and they haven't done this, that and the other. So don't let anybody believe that we can do this on a voluntary basis anymore because they've run into even worse trouble. Um, this particular issue was, was brought to the committee's attention by Deputy Fitzmaurice and he's outlined, outlined in a very passionate way, a very factual way,
the situation, particularly in Galway, and the group he refers to, um, you know, in Galway, GRD, or the local development company there. The same problem is trying to root our schemes in the west of Galway. Yes, thanks, Deputy. So the, all of Galway is it, and I think it actually is infecting other counties from my yeah. checking up. And the fear... And I'm also talking about the, there is a problem at the moment this year that has emerged where Galway County Council is looking for indemnity. There is, um, for the voluntary groups, and while you might be lucky, Deputy O'Keefe, that there's tools or RSS to do it everywhere, there is towns around the country, or small little villages, like Sabellamore Bridge and places like that, where local, local people go out and cut the grass on a voluntary basis, and they pick up the litter, and now they're expected to do three day signing and lighting, uh, and the one day, um, and there has to be basically plans done of everything. And this is just going to drive the voluntary people away. Fine if we're going to have someone paying for everything in the line of someone doing it, but to be honest about it, they're not there at the moment. Like even to get, this, anyone will tell you, to get two workers now is hard got. Isn't that fair to say in, in parts of the country? Parts of the country, yes, sir. And, and, and where they're, they're, they, if, they, if there was an, an answer brought to that, as Deputy O'Keefe pointed out, that to be extended or whatever, where you're struggling. But we are, and look, it, it, it's probably more people are working, and that's a great thing. But this work, no one could put a figure of what was done. And as was pointed out as well, Falsh Ireland, what has been done for this country for tourists going along looking at towns, um, and, and the enthusiasm of people in those areas. And the other one I want to address is this problem over a thousand cares, because I want that, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but there's some different stipulation when you go over a thousand cares in your town or your village. Thanks, Deputy. Um, no, but it, 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 this is a genuine issue that's raised in his head. We, we want to nip it at the bud. Basically, the tidy towns uh, committees right up and down this, this country to perform amazing work. I'm a former treasurer of my local tidy towns in Clare Castle, and they recently have been awarded a Community of the Year in Clare by um, Clare County Council, um, given their work over the years and various different projects. And at the heart of that is their pride in, in their village, tr trying to make the place more presentable. And you know, it, it's a very it's a social activity as well. But if you put all these barriers in the way, all this red tape, you know, you do and, and you will drive people away. Um, so I, I think it's a very sensible suggestion, you know, put forward by Deputy O'Queeve and, and Fitz Morris in relation to putting together a working group, uh, for the want of a better term, of, of all the different participants here and the stakeholders because it's the last thing we want to see, and even we had Minister Michael Ring in here a few weeks ago, and we raised this particular issue with him, and um, he, he was he was he was totally opposed to any um, move in this direction that you know there would be any barriers put in the way of of the tidy towns movements. And I note in in Mr. Garvey's opening statement, you you do make reference to the fact that you you do provide insurances to tidy towns um, groups and activities and in, in particular um, you make reference to that community projects including tidy towns, care and maintenance of community centres etc. Um, but the grey area is there and Deputy Fitzmaurice has put his finger on it. Do you, like in Galway it would seem that you have to have you know, a, a particular certificate that you have put up signs and lights and having to have done a course for a particular period of time. And these people are only cutting maybe grass verges on a voluntary basis, uh, whereas maybe the county council should be doing it, probably. But if you're relying on the county councils, it would never have been done. And you know the whole thing will come to a halt if you're putting that type of burden on, on community groups. And it's really, that's where we're coming from. So. Um, Perhaps, Mr. Garvey, you come back to the points raised by Deputy Fitzmaurice 
by Deputy O'Queeve and, and, and I, and will bring in uh, Mr Kerwin and Mr McHugh from, from, the, from the County Council side of it as well. Well, I acknowledge the great work that uh, Tidy Towns and other voluntary groups are doing in the local community, and um, I'm witness to it every day myself. Um, I think it's important that I, that I state at the outset, we don't insure Tidy Town associations. Um, the second thing is, we, we insure RSS, TUS and the uh, CES schemes, and we insure the, um, the employees who go out to work with those voluntary groups to do work. So if anything happens to any of those individuals, we cover the costs associated with any injury that, that they may happen to have. Um, there's also the fact, I suppose, that there's a lot of health and safety regulation that has to be complied with. Um, we know ourselves that if we are dealing with the personal injury claim and our insured hasn't complied with health and safety regulations, um, our defence is gone before we start. So um, the, the regulations are there for good reason. They're there to protect individuals. And no different from somebody driving a car and having to have insurance, somebody can get knocked down working on the side of the road, or somebody can get injured using equipment uh, that's in use, even if it's for a voluntary purpose. Um, we're here to see what we can do to help, but it's important that I state we have changed nothing in our uh, policies that we have, insurance policies we have, with any of these uh, employment groups. We haven't changed anything in relation to the insurance we provide to the local authorities. Um, all we do in relation to any of these groups is make them aware of what legislation, regulation, they need to be aware of and they need to observe uh, for purposes of protecting themselves. So that's where we are on this at the yeah, moment. Can you, what you're saying so is that you cover the RSS and the TUS. Why is there a situation at the moment when the different bodies that's over, the, say there's different names of groups in different counties, Eamon talked about Udras or whatever, um, that they are now saying that they want an indemnity from the tidy towns and they want an indemnity from the county council. What has changed that they this year want that? Is it not that they do their work that's required um, under the insurance that they have, under the health and safety regs that they have? And why are they now saying that um, jobs that were done down through the years, that they will need what they call a supervisor, that is the three-day course done, that can put out sign in the night. Um, and this is for cutting grass now. I'm not talking about, I understand you have to do a method statement. I worked on the construction side of it. I understand you have to do a method statement. You have to go through the proper procedures if you're building a wall. If you need to put up traffic lights and all that, yeah, you have to do all that and put up barriers. I understand all that. But I am talking about going in inside the 50 kilometre zone and there's a curb there on the side of the road and that's your lawn. And when you're above your lawnmower there and you're a voluntary person within in that town or you're a two's person that someone has to go out the road now 600 metres and put up all these signs and... What I am saying is, why is the body that you're insured in looking for this new thing? Because, in fairness, they probably haven't. There could be 50 towns in County Galway, or 20 towns in County Roscommon, or Mayo, or Clare, or wherever, that they're doing it, and they won't have a supervisor to be running around with a pick-up and throwing off signs and throwing them on, because when you put them out, you have to take them in again. And... This has now all of a sudden started happening and on top of that uh, the councils which you do ensure are looking that uh, the tidy towns will do everything in compliance with health and safety reg which means that even if they haven't a tooth or an RSS worker and if they're doing it voluntary, just think of that word, voluntary, that they have to 
get their own van. At least if if there was a supervisor, it might be a supervisor a, a, a van that was they were getting a few quid for. But these get it with their own van, buy their own signs, do their three day course, do their one day course to cut the same grass that they were cutting on the side of the curb for the last 15 or 20 years and they wanted to word about it. And why now are we left in that situation? And if we go down the road of doing everything, if there isn't some indemnity to them people given by be it councils or and working with their insurance and what the chairman said there and what Deputy O'Keefe said, I think, and I, don't, I wouldn't want it a talking shop, it's something that needs to be, this needs to be addressed quick, but that the different stakeholders, be it the representative body of all the tidy towns, the, the representative body of the councils and the road side of it especially, um, the insurance bodies and the representatives of, we we'll call it, the different um, groups that take care of the RSS and the thing. And if heads don't be banged together, we are going to see in Ireland shortly where people, like, we see the problems with insurance down through the years and people are afraid of their life. Well, I'm hardly going to go out as a voluntary person, am I? It's, I insure my care and I do this, that and that. I'm hardly going to go out as a voluntary person. Sign a forum, and I do not voluntary, to send into the council, to send into the body that's over RSS and TOOS. I, as an individual, sign this, and I do not voluntary for the betterment of my village or my town or my private place. And if we think that people are going to stay doing that, we have an explosion coming, guys, that the councils will be responsible for cutting the grass or doing work like that. And that won't happen because we can't even put the fill the potholes in places, not to mind to go cutting grass and go cleaning streets. And the amount of work that they put in, those people, in every little village, mightn't seem much to someone in, in some parts of the country, but the pride that they have in it, in their place. And all we're doing is saying, well, look, guys, you need to go by the usual health and safety regulations and do this, that, and that. When the snow was out a few years ago, we went along the road with our fertiliser spreader and we shook it. And do you know what we found out later? Oh, by, by the way, you were, it was against the law. You, were, you weren't covered in your insurance. So. And then when it came, I think, down south, was it one of the storms? Finally, the penny dropped and the state did say, if farmers go out and do that, they're covered because they were doing good. And it was done in trying to do it in the public interest or the benefit of your country. And if we cannot do something like that for the tidy towns groups to go forward with it, I'm not saying you go out in the middle of the road and stand in the middle of the road waiting for a car to hit you. But Lord God, if you're within with the lawnmower and the side of a verge and someone looking for signs up the road 600 metres, uh, it's gone wrong. And we need to have some indemnity for those people. And I am asking, I agree with the chairman, and I want to thank him and his staff for the, this meeting. We need to get your heads together and not, I don't want to talk and shop going on for months because there's a, there's, there's a penny dropped at the moment in a lot of villages or a lot of towns. And these people are sick to the teeth of getting rules and regs. And next thing you'll, 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 you'll walk away from it. Thanks, Deputy. Deputy. Okay. I, I have a view. We bring in laws of safety laws and all the rest. So we can't really say you don't have to comply with them. Uh, that's number one. So the first thing I think we need is between you all to develop a manual as to what circumstances you have to have whatever in terms of training, signage and all the other requirements, safety equipment and so on. Now, having decided that, the next issue, as far as I'm concerned, then, is how do you comply? In other words, and that's voluntary, and as I said, we've got problems with the schemes in certain places, and the schemes. In terms of training, and then in terms, if you're requiring signage or whatever, where, what you need to do. Third thing then is, with the voluntary workers, training can be a problem. That's a fair point. 
with the tools and whatever workers, it should be just done. Right? No, I'll come to that in a minute. That's number three on the list. So, as far as I'm concerned, the next thing we need to do is see how we arrange the training to be carried out on the required people. And maybe we have to go, and this was one of the things I had, well, it was in the original RSS, I don't know if it still exists, that the work time didn't have to be nine to five if the workers agreed. So we used to get people coming into football pitches at seven and eight in the evening, cleaning up the dressing rooms after matches and so on. And as long as they got the 19 and a half hours a week, we were flexible. And therefore, that if you need a mixture of tools and voluntary to do certain things, in other words, tools doing the safety part, and voluntary, well, so be it. And at least have it written in the scheme that as long as the local TUS or RSS worker or CE worker is willing to work in those hours rather than the standard hours, when people will be free in the evening to do these kind of things, sound out. The next issue then is how do you fund all this? I don't care who funds it because I know one thing there's only one group of people that can fund it, and that's the taxpayer. But I don't. State agencies are like the Nile Delta now. It comes in in one source, and it breaks up into thousands of little bits across all the agencies. And sometimes there's more war between the agencies, but it's all state money anyway. It's the same vote to the actors, no matter who funds it. So that you decide amongst yourself who will fund this, and get it funded. And as I said, I think voluntary people put enough in by putting all their time and their effort in, rather than having to actually fund all of this as well, and equipment and so on. Uh, and the, the, the next thing comes to the insurances. Now, it seems to me that every state agency is an advisor. And the advisor is, try and make me not liable. So, Udras, county councils, all these bodies are always looking for indemnity from whoever. Now, I know what happens. Somebody gets injured, unfortunately, and it does happen. And the person who's suing will sue everybody in sight. The individual probably wouldn't be too bothered about that. They'd reckon they wouldn't get the money. They'll sue the local community group. They'll sue the CE. So that'll be the local partnership or whatever, the CE company. They'll sue the county council, and they'll sue anybody in sight that they can sue. My understanding was that often the award is given against the strongest financial entity there. But you know something? In this case, it's irrelevant. Because if the case is won alone, that the person's not going to be li personally liable, the only people who are going to wind up funding this is the taxpayer, to whichever one of these Nile Delta streams we're going to get. So decide how we just cross indemnify this stuff in whatever way you want it. One would imagine that the liability injustice as opposed to the strongest player should lie with whoever was culpable but if you are working for a group and that group was covered like an employee's an employer's liability or uh, sorry if you're an employer and some an employee makes a mistake you take the rap not the employee and not the system so what i'm saying is allowing that the individual is not going to be liable as long as they're covered by insurance uh, decide how you're going to work out these indemnities but it should be just sorted out between the groups rather than going. You see, what happens is body A says to the weakest body, i.e. the community body, you get the indemnity from body B or you give us the indemnity, even though body A is a lot stronger body, the local authority or partnership or whatever. I think those things should be arranged for recognised community groups and so on, so that there would be a clear thing that all the indemnities would be part of the package, but that it would be agreed that it would be given. Because it's ridiculous to ask a community group to go to a local authority and get the indemnity. They're not. The community group are the weakest player in this. It would be much better if the state arranged that if you were a community group and they were satisfied <coughs> with the standard of your group, that they would agree whatever indemnities were given were part of the package and that they'd fund that accordingly. So I see four steps in this. I think if a working group could get to these four steps systematically, what you need to do 
in other words, the manual, the training, the equipment, flexibility in the tool scheme, whatever, and RSS and so on. And then finally, the indemnities. And come back with a clear 10-page leaflet as to what you have to do, I think would resolve the problem. As I said, I'm absolutely utterly convinced the one place you can't go is to say ignore the law or safety standards in the law because it's the law. If you want to do that, we'd have to come back in here and change the law, to be quite honest, because as long as the law is the law, the law is the law. And any insurance, any person hurt is going to go to the court on the basis of the law, not on any arrangement. Just one thing I forgot to say as well is that there's a situation with the partnership uh, groups. What they are saying at the moment, if you have a tooth worker and uh, they are cutting grass, well, Joe down the road there, that's the voluntary person, they will be asking the voluntary group in that area to put, get the signs, put out the signs, Johnny will come along and his lawnmower and cut it from tooth, and Joe has to go back again in voluntary fella or woman and uh, take all the signs down. Now, that's not feasible in any world. And councils need to get involved in this for the simple reason that work is being done in that town, and it's actually, to put it bluntly, it's council work, to put it bluntly. And someone might address from the councils this thousand care rule. What's the difference? What's the difference under it and over it? And explain it to me. Very much, Deputy. Um, there's a number of questions there, um, Mr. McHugh, in, in terms of the council's role in, in, in all of this. And, um, and my understanding, and even in Mr. Garvey's opening statement, he did make reference to tidy towns' activities. And obviously, the councils are insured, IPB. C could, the, could the councils take local tidy towns groups under their wing? and extend their indemnity to yourselves. Have you a view on that? And possibly you might take up the questions put by Deputy Fitzmaurice and Deputy O'Keefe, and then we'll take Mr. Garvey and Mr. Kerwin. Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm probably not best placed to comment on, on rural towns and, and, and villages because we don't really have that in my, 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 my authority. Um, there's a few questions raised in relation to uh, insurance questions generally. In most local authorities operate a community grant scheme uh, and community organisations who incur insurance costs or insurance overheads, uh, there's normally a scheme of grants that would normally assist them, uh, including in, in, in my own authority in, in Dunleer at Down. Um, there's other, other issues that were raised in relation to, we, we, don't, we, we have a direct labour workforce, we have contracting in, 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 of, of various services, uh, so all of our grass cutting and all of our roadside works uh, are done either by a combination of direct labour or contractors on our behalf. So our tidy townspeople wouldn't normally they do community cleanups and litter cleanups, and we assist them towards that. We don't, in, 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 we don't require uh, insurance indemnity or whatever. We do issue guidelines in relation to the use of equipment and how people should actually uh, operate on, on roadsides. But we don't, as they say, ordinarily allow or permit people to work on our, on our live carriageways. I understand what yes. you're Sorry for interrupting you. But like we're talking about chalk and cheese here. Two yeah, the two Come countries. Yeah. We have a situation. Are you, are you representing the, the, all the managers, or is it just yourself? Or the, the I was, I was asked to come in here to, to support IPB in relation to any, any questions about particular local authority services. I wasn't aware of this particular instance, so obviously yeah, I'm not like familiar with this the situation is, in Galway. Maybe, maybe you could come back to us on this, um, but we're, we're in a situation down the country, and I understand the parks and all the different things. We have, we have small towns that there might be 100 people in or 50 people in or 300 people in and they go out voluntary themselves because there's no council people or no parks people or anything. They do it themselves voluntary, do you understand me? And they have their own little insurance, they call themselves the Tidy Towns Group and in fairness to Minister Ring, he gives them money each year to, to pay for cutting the grass and do an insurance in it. Um, and, but we're, they're left in a situation of they're voluntary. They're not like you were set up in Dublin, um, where you have your own staff or you sub it out to a subcontractor, and I understand that. But like we're talking about apples and oranges here, yeah. to be honest about it. The one thing I would add is because... Do you know anything about the 1,000 care rule? Or? 
No, but I am aware of the signing, lighting and guarding requirements, uh, which obviously apply to both our own staff and, and contract, contractor staff there too. Uh, and they are very um, um, stringent requirements in relation to that. Uh, and in the event of something going wrong, it's not only you know, insurance um, uh, consequences, there's also criminal consequences in relation to uh, the person who, who put the, those, those situations in place. So it's not simply a, an insurance uh, cover uh, element, because in the event of something going wrong, uh, you know, the HSA would ordinarily get involved, and there are potential criminal prosecutions and investigations. Where is the, the said the time of storm in, or one of them storms, um, as I pointed out, the time of the snow when we hit it off ourselves and just done it and got it done with, and that was it. But when Storm Emma came along, it, there was an announcement from the state. Is it the councils that cover that? Is it the IPB that cover that? Where people doing goodwill work um, or a good deed for their, no more than if someone was choking and you went to save them and that they died, you're not going to be prosecuted. But that. The, the same that if you were doing goodwill work in a tidy, in a small little village or town, uh, clipping the grass or doing something like that, where does it come in or how could we get to a state that those people would be covered um, for doing the goodwill gesture? There was a particular, I suppose, occasion uh, post Storm Emma, um, but my understanding is that they, once the, the local farmers or, or community uh, operated within the guidelines uh, which were which were issued at national and, and at local level uh, that there was a, a, a cover or an insurance cover provided by, by the local local authorities. I don't know if that's possible in, in relation to, to tidy towns. As I say, I, I'm speaking from a different perspective entirely because we do have very very active tidy towns associations and, 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 and groupings within my own uh, local authority, but they, they don't do the, the types of works that you were that you were referring to earlier on. So I really can't comment on that. Well, unfortunately, I have to go. Um, my view is there's a lot of technical stuff here on the different headings. And an emergency is different than an ongoing situation. And I can't see getting out of any, you know, legally insurance wise, it just seems to be a no brainer that you have to comply. End story. That's the whole plan. Yeah. I just would make a plea that we get a working group of all the parties, local authorities, partnerships, departments sure or whatever and see can we sort out the manual that we need so that everyone can comply and to get the resources to comply and the training to comply now it seems to me the world is on its head because it seems to me that if it is does require sophisticated signage or whatever and if that's the way it is that's the way it is then the tooth worker should actually provide that and the bottom worker should cut the grass could I, could I just ask a question? Would, would each group be interested in coming on a working group to address the issues that, that have been outlined? Or do you feel that it is an issue at all? Well, clearly it is an issue uh, because we wouldn't have been called in here today if it wasn't. Um, from our point of view, as I said before, we haven't changed anything. Um, the big challenge here is there's a far greater onus perhaps in certain quarters in relation to compliance with regulation, health and safety. And that is coming about as a result of the fact that, you know, the awards in the courts in relation to injuries are, are a challenge, which we have a cost of insurance review group looking at at the moment. Um, that situation hasn't gone away. And as long as we see uh, awards of the scale being made, and as long as we see criminal prosecutions for failure to observe health and safety regulation, I think we have a challenge. As insurers to the local authorities, uh, we certainly are happy to sit down with our local authority members to discuss the fact that we were here today. Um, it seems to me that the practice isn't, isn't consistent across the country, that clearly, Deputy Fitzmaurice, in the area that you represent, there seems to be a challenge. Uh, I, I, I wasn't aware of these issues until we came in here today, so it's very hard for me to say what needs to be done in that regard. But from IPB's position, we're happy to sit down with our members who are uh, the local authorities. We ensure the groups that provide a lot of this uh, employment and um, see what we can do to, to help that situation. Would you be willing, and we can put it to a proposal here, would you be willing, um, the IPB, a representative from the county managers, and I think that it needs to be, with no disrespect to anybody from Dublin, I want to be clear about that, 
but it needs to be somebody that's au fait with the set up that's down the country in a and I'm not taken from him and in any way because it's a different system that's used in Dublin um, and the representatives of the partnerships plus the representatives of the tidy towns groups or the PP are in numbers whatever you call that the some thing names that's on that um, and if one or two of us needs to sit in on it, I th I'm asking, is each person, would, the, would you be prepared to work with that chairman and would the different uh, people here, as well as writing to the partnership bodies, to sit down and trash this out? Because in fairness to Deputy O'Keefe, what he said there, the tools worker, if they were done on the same and late, and the finance person to do it, do you know what I mean? But, we're left in a quagmire at the moment, and all that's going over and back now to councils is paperwork over to councils, giving your list of non-construction and construction. But then that will be looked at by the partnership, and if the non-construction, which is grass cutting, is on the side of the road, then they'll say, well, we need sign and lighting, and you need to put up signs. So, like, we're not making headway on this. We need to have it clear, precise, and I would recommend as well, Mr Chairman, that a rep from the Department of Rural Affairs would be on it, uh, that, that department, in case there's a need for a few pound or, or, and social protection, because it's Regina Doherty's, uh, it's, her, it's her area that's doing the TUS, and I presume the RSS as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Um, yeah, there is a willingness there to cooperate with, with a working group. Um, Mr. Kerman, we haven't heard from you on, on that, but I'm just maybe assuming that, but you get involved in the state's claims. Um, I, I suppose, Chair, we are um, in reality sort of tangentially involved uh, in, in, in many of these matters. So, so we don't, as I said, have a direct state indemnity that does not cover the tidy towns. As state indemnity does not cover many of these schemes. However, uh, I will say, uh, and, and it's perhaps to Deputy Fismaris's point, that um, there is a there is a level of misunderstanding and bureaucracy sometimes that maybe that you know a working group could actually cut through. Yeah. We ourselves sometimes we, we are involved, perhaps uh, as I said, a little bit tangentially with say like the like CE programs or uh, some of the other schemes whereby you know some of the delegated state authorities that we indemnify are actually taken on a volunteer worker. Uh, and in that case, you know, state indemnity probably works to advantage there where you know, there is not a renewal of policy. Uh, once we can get those people to fully understand that like, once an employee is working for the HSE or a voluntary body, let's say on a temporary basis, uh, state indemnity just, just covers the activities that they're doing for that period of time that they're working there. And it sort of simplifies, simplifies that process. Uh, so perhaps a working group like that, I'm, 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 I'm not sure, uh, how much we have to contribute to it, but we're absolutely willing to be to be involved uh, in any initiative of that sort. Very good, very good. No, and I think Deputy Fitzmaurice, you'd have to have a representative from the Department of Rural Community Development, and from the Department of Employment and Social Protection as well. Um, but thanks for your contribution today um, on that, and we, we will be in touch. We, we will set up a working group. Um, there is an urgency in this because you're coming into you know, a, a very um, busy time for tidy towns groups, and as it's hap this is actually happening in Galway as we speak. Um, the last thing you want to do is, is see people, you know, being forced to, to leave um, their voluntary activity in, in their community because of red tape. So we, we'll set up that um, working group, and I'd like to thank each and every one of yourselves for coming here today and for giving your evidence um, to the committee. And um, we will be in touch in due course. Thank you. The, the next meeting of the Joint Committee scheduled for the 29th of May 2019 is proposed that the Joint Committee adjourn until 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday, the 29th of May. Is that agreed? Agreed. The Joint Committee is now adjourned until 10.30 on Wednesday, the 29th of May 2019.